right, thank you everyone that uh, had a part in our music service tonight. Praise the Lord, amen. Well, we uh, start a new series tonight in Going Deeper. It's a journey of spiritual maturity. Tonight we're going to learn uh, just how mature we are, or if we're mature at all, in the Lord. We're going to look at some things that are and are not, what is and what is not, uh, with the Scripture as we start this new deeper into a spiritual journey of maturity in our lives and our spiritual life. So I would draw your attention to 1 Peter tonight with me, if you would please. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 2. In 1 Peter 2.2, 2, everybody turning your Bibles there. And then if you would, while you're there, just back up a little bit. I know you have them in your notes, but I'd also like to read the Word tonight. Back up just a page or two into Hebrews chapter 5, if you would, please. Hebrews chapter 5, in just a minute, two verses we'll look at here to get started. Everybody in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, and everybody have a study guide tonight with you to follow along as we study the Word of God tonight, Wednesday night in the Word. And so that's what we're going to do, get in the Word, and we're going to start going. Now, tonight will be a little bit of groundwork, but after this, it's going to get deeper and deeper into the Word of God. So, Father, we thank you for tonight. We praise you. Thank you for the wonderful music we've heard and listened to how it has touched our hearts and for the congregational singing as well as our instrumental song on Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Lord, we thank you and we praise you now. Now, Holy Spirit, be our teacher, our guide. We ask you would give us illumination, understanding of the Word. Open our hearts, our minds, our understanding, Lord, that we may receive that which you have for us tonight. And by all means, help us not to be hearers only, but to be doers of the Word as we put it to practice and application in our lives in the days ahead. Now, precious Holy Spirit of God, be with your servant. Father, enlighten his heart and mind and eyes and lips tonight. Speak through him, and only Jesus can, and bring to remembrance the things Jesus has said to us, and we'll be grateful and thankful for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. First Peter 2, 2 says, as newborn babes. Now, he's not saying that you're a baby there. He's using an illustration here, that of a baby, a newborn baby. Now, there's been a newborn baby into a family here recently, and we all know about newborn babies, don't we? And one of the first things a newborn baby does when it comes out crying, it's hungry. Can everybody agree on that? Newborn babies are hungry. And newborn babies desire the milk from their mother that God has so graciously provided through the mother. And that's what they do, and they need that to grow. Without that, they don't grow. And with that, God has provided through that the, the miraculous of everything that that baby needs. The vitamins and minerals and nutrients, everything that that child needs to cause that child to grow, and boy, do they. Don't they? They grow faster than weeds. You see them one moment when they're born, and, and it's been a few weeks go by, and all of a sudden, my goodness, and then you see them two months later, and they're crawling around, and three months later, they're pulling the curtains off the wall, and I mean, it's just my goodness. And, uh, and, and where does all that come from, from the nutrition that the mother provides? And so Paul, uh, Peter uses that illustration here for us as believers. If we're going to grow, then we're going to need the Word. And the Word is the milk of God. And so as newborn babies, he says, desire the sincere milk of the Word. That is the Logos, the Word of God. For what reason why, Peter? That we may grow thereby. You're not going to grow spiritually and mature without the Word of God. Just impossible. You can't. And so just like that baby, that baby's not going to grow without mother. Whether the mother does it naturally or uses the bottle, it makes no difference. The baby is going to need that. And so it's important. It's just like you and I, folks. And you know what? If, if that baby doesn't get that after so long a period, that baby's in trouble. Well, if you and I don't get the spiritual nutrients that we need, we're in trouble. Okay? 
So we're going to be going deeper tonight, Hebrews chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, flip back to there, and then we'll get started here. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 14, follow along with me, if you would, please, as we look at that. Hebrews 5, 14, the Bible says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Now, he's not talking about age, numerical age. He's talking about those that are mature in the Lord are the ones that strong meat is for. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. One of the big reasons for studying the Word of God and growing in the Word of God is so that you and I will have discernment. That's one of the biggest things that's missing in the lives of believers today is discernment. A spiritual discernment. So we're going to look at that this evening. So let's take a look at it here first of all. What is the path to spiritual maturity tonight? What is the path to spiritual maturity? And I want us to all think about tonight where we're at in our spiritual life. How far along do we think we are? How mature do we think we are? And then we're going to compare it with God's Word tonight and see where we really are. And then we'll know where we need to work. Amen? Amen? All right, because we all need to grow. And it's a lifelong process. You don't be a Christian a year or two and say, okay, I'm mature, that's something we're done, we're finished, and you don't need to grow anymore. No, you do that, you're going to die spiritually. I can tell you that right now. You will die spiritually. So let's take a look at it. First of all, I want to give you three things that spiritual maturity is not. That it is not. Spiritual maturity, first of all, is not based on the length of time since you gave your heart to Christ. Spiritual maturity is not based on the time that you gave your life to Christ. Some of you have been saved a year. Some of you two years. Some of you 70 years. That is, but that's not, what, that's not what spiritual maturity is. Okay? Secondly, spiritual maturity is not based on your knowledge of the Bible. Amen. A lot of people have knowledge. There are lost people today that go to college and take college courses uh, of religion and study the religion and Bibles and all that kind of stuff. There are people that have, a, there's believers you've been around that have a tremendous knowledge of the Scripture, but act like babies, live like babies. They haven't matured yet, even though they have knowledge. So as we sit here and think, well, I think I got quite a bit of knowledge of the Bible. Well, that's not spiritual maturity. I'm glad you have that knowledge, and you should have it. We'll get into that later. Spiritual maturity is not based on your good deeds, your acts, your actions, your good deeds. A lot of people do a lot of good deeds, but that doesn't necessarily make them spiritually mature, especially in the Christian life. All right? So it's not based on that. So those three things, as we take a look at ourselves tonight, we can start thinking, well, guess what? Um, i got to check uh, X on number one, X on number two, X on number three. I'm not doing too good here. Amen. All right. So, but spiritual maturity is based on your obedience to the truth that you have received. See, that's why age has nothing to do with it. Because you can take a person that's been, 70, been saved 70 years, but has a struggle obeying the Word of God. Then you can take a person like Marley that got saved here last year, and she got saved. And yet she's obedient to the Scriptures you can get. Do you realize, according to Scripture, she's more mature than the one that's been saved 70 years? See, the family's laughing, but that's the truth. Because her maturity is based on her obedience to the truth that she's heard and received. Not how old she is. Good example. Was Jesus God? Come on, talk to me. Was he also man? Was he 100% man? So at the age of 12, what was he doing? Huh? What was he doing? He was in the temple teaching the, law, the lawyers, the Pharisees, and all of those guys. And they marveled at his wisdom and his doctrine, yet he was only 12 years old. And all those Pharisees and rabbis were, you know, up in age, been studying the Old Testament all their life. And he comes in and opens it up and begins to expound the scriptures. And they sit there in total amazement and marvel at the wisdom of this 12-year-old. So who had the greater maturity? Jesus did. Over the scribes, Pharisees, and all that gang. So you see, that's why, look at what Colossians says now with me. Read along with me. 
as you have therefore received Christ the Lord. How many of you received the Lord here tonight? All right, here's the command, imperative command. Walk ye in him. Now, how am I to walk in him? Rooted and built up in him. That means being grounded in the word of God. That's why it opens up with a tree. That's why you got a tree there on the front of your outline. All right, you see those roots are going down deep. They're not going out like the oak trees. They're going down. <laughs> All right. Walking rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught. Hello. Abounding, and that word abounding means growing, and you're to be growing therein with what? Thanksgiving. All right. So what is the path to spiritual maturity? Three things. It is not length of age. It is not based on your knowledge of the Bible, and it's not based on your good deeds. But the pathway to spiritual maturity is based on your obedience to the truth that you hear. The truth, as we just read in the Colossians there, the truth of what you've been taught. All right, so here we go. So then what is spiritual immaturity? What is spiritual immaturity? Now we'll go down through these. We've got just one verse with each one. So follow along with me. First of all, I want you to understand that spiritual immaturity is living a selfish lifestyle. See, folks, if it's all about you all the time, you're living a selfish lifestyle. I don't care how spiritual you say you are or think you are, you're not spiritually mature because it's all about you. That's spiritual immaturity when, it's, when that's your lifestyle is selfish. Always thinking about you. Everything is right for you. Everything's going to work out for you. Everything's going for you. I mean, we could go on and on with that list, and we've all been around people like that. Amen. Yeah, if we're not careful, we get that way. Well, this whole thing focuses on me. This whole situation is all about me, my feelings. Mmm. We're so concerned about my feelings and how I think and how I feel. That's a sign of immaturity. Listen to what our brother James says. For where envy and strife, what's envy? Jealousy. Strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. So you see, if our lifestyle is all about us and what we can get and what we can gain and what we can have and my way and the highway and all of this stuff, then folks, we may be safe, but you're spiritually immature. Now I'm going to go through these. Spiritual immaturity is truth without grace without tr and grace without truth. Listen to what Moses said about Moses here and John said about Moses. And of his fullness have all received the grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. See, the law, Moses was the lawgiver. And Moses gave the law. Now, God gave it to Moses, but Moses gave the law. He was the lawgiver. He wrote the first book, five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the law. But the Bible says grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. That's why we're saved by grace and truth and not the law. Because the law could not save us. You see, grace and truth did what the law could not do. All the law could do was condemn us to death. So you see, if, if, if our truth is without grace, then our grace is without truth. That's spiritual immaturity. Here's the third one. Spiritual immaturity is pride in knowledge of the Bible or spiritual accomplishments. You ever been around people like that? They think they're professors. Got PhDs over the Bible. Amen. Haven't been to college or studied anything, but they've got PhDs on the Bible over you. Or you hear them talk about all their accomplishments. Now, I know some preachers like that. I've been around them, and I've heard them. And they have knowledge of the Bible and not knowledge of the Scripture. But they don't mind letting you know all what they've done and what they've accomplished. And that's pride. And see, whenever we have pride, that's spiritual immaturity. 
we're not mature in Christ if there's pride in us. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Amen? Everybody got knowledge here tonight? We're talking about the pride thing here. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth, or love buildeth up. So you see, if we're full of pride, we are spiritually immature. So this is a little thermometer gauge for us tonight to see where we're at with our spiritual maturity, with our growth, how we're doing. And so don't anybody get upset or upset, just take a look at it and say, okay, listen to what the scripture says here. Okay, a spiritual immaturity filled with jealousy and quarreling. Here we go. For ye are yet carnal, Paul says. For whereas there is among you, what church? Envy, that's jealousy, and strife, and divisions. Are you not carnal? And you walk as men. This is his letter to the church of Corinth. Okay? Let's look at a fifth one. Spiritual immaturity is seen by instability in life and belief. Paul says in Ephesians 4.14, that we henceforth be no more children. Now watch this. This is important because I see a lot of this today in the church and amongst believers. All right, there, there's, a, there's immaturity in, this, in their stability in their life and what they believe. Paul says that henceforth be no more children. Now here's, the, here's, the, here's, the, here's an immature believer who is tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And boy, do I see that today and hear that today as I'm talking around people. And I wonder, where in the world are they coming with their doctrine? Where are they going with their doctrine? Who did you hear that from? Where did you get that? Well, I got this off some guy on the TV or the radio, or I heard this guy. I said, well, oh my God, do you even know who that person is? Do you know what they believe? Do you know what they stand for? Do you even know anything about them? Their doctrine at all? And yet you swallow it hook, line, and sinker. Look what it says here. We're not to be children. See, the mature believer isn't going to be like a child that's going to be tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now notice how this every wind of doctrine comes down to pike. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive you. And, and we have that today. People just don't even know what they believe or why they believe it. You know, as a pastor, when people leave, you know, my biggest concern is, is I love to hear that they've gone and found a good Bible-believing, preaching, teaching church and have got in and got involved and gone to work. And I feel good because then I feel like at least I did my job while they were here. But when they take off and go down the road and they go to this doctrine and that doctrine and this faith and that faith and they're just wondering about it, I go, what in the world happened? And you'd call them or talk to them, well, well, this, this, and this, and say, and they don't give a hoot what they believe. They don't give a hoot about doctrine. Well, Paul says that person is immature. They're like a child. They're being tossed to and fro with the wind. Folks, don't accept everything that comes down the bike and it comes blowing in on the wind, all right? Because I could have given you a good example of that at my house today to what the wind can do. I was thinking about that. I was just thinking about this. Wow, you want to talk about wind and doctrine? My goodness, look what's going on outside. Man, there were branches being tossed and thrown everywhere, my flag thrown everywhere, garbage cans going everywhere. And I go, there goes all the doctrine. So, instability. Number six, spiritual immaturity lacks unity and harmony. Okay, this is what Brother Paul says again in Corinthians. Be of one mind. How many minds? One mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. We must maintain unity in the church. We must be of one accord, one mind, one purpose, one heart, and maintain unity. If we do, then we are a body of mature believers. But if we're not, then we are immature. Okay? Here's another one. Number seven, spiritual immaturity is more focused on cares, riches, and pleasures. 
This, this tells you whether you're immature or not tonight. Paul said in the last days, talking to young Timothy, he said in the last days that men are going to be lovers more of pleasure than lovers of God. He didn't say they wouldn't, didn't love God, but they're going to love pleasure more than God. And he goes through that whole list there. Well, let's look what Dr. Luke says concerning that. Dr. Luke says this, And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, he's talking about when they've heard the word, they go forth and they're choked with, notice three things, cares, riches, and pleasures of this life. Now what's, hap- what's, the, what's the problem? What happens when that happens? Look what it says. And they bring no fruit to perfection. And by the word, that word perfection there is maturity. It can be translated maturity. It can also be translated complete. They bring no fruit to completion in their life. No fruit to maturity in their life. No fruit to perfection in their life. Because they're concerned with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this world. Now, if that's where you're at tonight, as we go through this, you see, then we're not as spiritual mature as we think we are. We have some struggles. In other words, we have some work to do. Okay, don't get mad, get upset over this thing. You know, nobody say, just, okay, there's an area in my life that what I'm learning tonight, the Spirit of God is showing to me, speaking to me through the Word of God, there's an area that I need to work on my life so I can go from being immature to being mature. And that's what this is all about, is we're going to go deeper into spiritual maturity into our lives. And we're going to really get a good look at ourselves. All right, let's look at the last one. I think this one is. All right. Spiritual immaturity seems to be identified more by the actions of sinful nature. We're going to read here 17 sins of the deeds of the flesh. Now that's more of the lost crowd. But hey, there are believers that do these sins too. And those that do are definitely immature. Okay? Look at this. Now the works of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh are manifest. They're made known. They're revealed. Which are these? Here we go. The first four are sins of immorality. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Those are four sins of immorality. Idolatry. What's idolatry? That's putting anything before God. Anything you spend more time on, more money of, more pleasure with, uh, and before God, it's, it's an idol. It's idolatry, the Bible says. Okay, idolatry, witchcraft. Stay out of witchcraft. Come on, can I get an amen tonight? Stay out of sorcery, stay out of talking to the deaf, stay away from the Ouija boards and the, and the tarot cards and then Dungeons and Dragons and ter- Harry Potter. That's all witchcraft. That's not the place for a mature believer to be. Okay? Then he goes on with others here. He lists his hatred, variance, emulations. I have all this written down in my other study by, uh, to give you the definitions of all those, but wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, there's jealousy, murders, drunkenness, re- revelings, that's rioting, and such the like. He says, of which I tell you before. I told you this before, Paul said to the church of Galatians, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's some pretty strong stuff. See, if you know somebody that says they're saved and born again, and yet they're living this, practicing this, I'm not saying they can't slip up and sin. Everybody does. But it's just their lifestyle. They practice it. They live it. I mean, they're just constantly doing it. Then, my friends, they're not even immature. They're not even saved. Because Paul said, they that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I didn't say that. The Word of God did. So spiritual maturity sometimes is defined by the actions of there. So, so then what is spiritual maturity tonight? Let's go through quickly through these. What is spiritual maturity? So as we went down through that list, I hope we all had a good look to see if there's some areas we need to work on. That's what we're here for tonight, to help and work. Okay? Because the goal is to become spiritual mature in Christ. And, and, and His Standard and rule book is different than ours. See, when we think we're so mature and spiritual mature and have reached the level, and the Lord says, No, you got a lot ways to go. 
<laughs> you got a lot more ways to go, more work to do, all right? Always work to do. All right, spiritual maturity, then here we go. First of all, is abounding in love. It's abounding in love. It's not selfish. Remember the first one was selfish, lifestyle. No, no, if you're going to be spiritually mature, then you're going to, and what does the word abounding mean? Growing. Growing in love, okay? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. How, church? If you have love one for another. So how are you doing loving one another? See, if we're not loving one another, then we're spiritually mature. So we, here's another area we need to work on, okay? Spiritual maturity is growing in knowledge. This is what uh, Paul says to Philippians here. And this I pray, that your love may abound, that your love may grow, okay? Because that was the first thing we talked about, right? Love, but watch this. Yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment or discernment. Okay? Third one, spiritual maturity is increasing in discernment. Paul said again in Philippians writing, he says, that ye may approve things that are excellent. First part of that verse. Here's what I see a lot of believers lack spiritual discernment. And because we see it in their lifestyle, the way they live, the way they go, what they're doing, what they're watching, what they're reading, what they're wearing, I mean, on and on. And you say, well, wait a minute, you have no spiritual discernment. And if we don't have spiritual discernment, then we're spiritually immature, not spiritually mature. The believer today needs discernment. There's a lot of lack of spiritual discernment today in the body of Christ. We tolerate, allow everything, do everything, and there's no spiritual discernment. So that, that's a, I think that's a big area that needs to be worked on. Spiritual maturity is evident in the integrity demonstrated. That's the second part of that verse. That ye may be sincere and without offense, how long? For how long? Till the day of Christ. Don't you think we ought to live in integrity? Well, it's going to take spiritual discernment to do that. I wish we could get internet here. We can if somebody wants to pay for it. Is God just leading somebody and pressing on someone's heart to pay for internet for our church? Then we can live stream the services. We can go on the internet, uh, live stream Facebook live while we're doing it. Another avenue and way to reach people for Christ. But in order to live stream, we've got to have a minimum of seven megabytes of upload. Or you can't do it. It won't work. It drags, it blurps, it, 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 it's just a mess. So you've got to have a minimum of seven, okay, for an upload to upload the signal. Or here I am doing this, and I'm, come on, man, let's go get with it. And you're sitting there watching it, and... I'm already way over here already. So no one's going to watch that. No one's going to listen to that. Now, we have talked with CenturyLink, and they will put us in a direct line from that box down at the end of the street there, across the street, that big box. They will bury and bring a cable in, bring it over to the corner of our building and take it up there and give us a direct line for Internet and promise us that they will give us 80 download, 80 megabyte download. That's slow compared to what we have at home. But, uh, and, and 10 upload. Guaranteed 10 upload, 10 megabyte upload, which is good for live streaming. So when I'm moving, it's moving. And we're getting good color and everything. But it's $180 a month. Now we go, woo woo, but again, what is a soul worth? Can we put a price on souls? If our church is so geared to the media, to reaching our world for Christ, it costs, church. It doesn't come for free. Our television ministry, I just gave Miss Eason tonight $200 worth of stamps. Nobody gives us that. You give it, and we put it on all that CDs and mail out. What, uh, what are we mailing out now, Miss Eason, a month? Uh, 209. 209 a month are going out all over the United States. Who pays for that? You do with your tithes and offerings. It's a vitally important ministry. I've got about six or eight calls. I've got to bring her in tomorrow coming in from off the television. And for Cox that you pay for and, and Channel Super 55 and, and the radio station, you see, all of that cost to, to get the gospel out to reach people for Christ. 
And if we say we love God as much as we do, and we love souls as much as we do, and we want to reach people for Christ, we believe the trumpet's about to sound, the wedding's about to take price, the groom's coming for the bride, and we're to get out of here, and we want to reach as many people for Christ and take as many to heaven with us as we can in the time that we've got, then it's going to cost us something. That's the best we can do out here. Can't get anything else. We've gone all different routes and tried everything. But if we did that, and we would live stream every one of our servers. Like right now while I'm on, we would be live streaming, and we would put it out, I don't think, what do we call it, public or something like that, Ted? We send it public? Yeah, and it just goes everywhere. Anybody that's out there gets it. Where's everybody at today? On Facebook. Where are we reaching our audience today? It's on Facebook. What's happening to our churches in California that are shut down now? In Washington and Oregon and Illinois and moving across the state. You know where they got to go? Facebook. You know where they got to go? YouTube. Website. Why it's still open. I mean, that's where we're at, folks. So we got to take advantage of every opportunity and every door that God opens up for us. And that's another avenue, another way of especially reaching our county live that people can't come out here because they're going to get it a week or two weeks later either on YouTube or, or whatever, or the television eventually on Cox. But a lot of people don't have Cox. But everybody's on Facebook. And if you announce it and let it know, then there's another great opportunity for us to reach people with the gospel. But CenturyLink will not come out here and put that in until we sign a contract at $180 a month. But some of us spend more money than that on good night. Pleasure. So we love pleasure more than we love God. Now, preacher, don't go to bed. No, I'm just telling you the truth. <laughs> Thank you, sister. But we do. That's why we got to go back and take a look at our priorities. See, folks, we're not doing all that just to brag about, wow, our church is on television and we're on the radio, we're on TV. No, 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 no. That's the wrong attitude. No, no, we don't take that attitude. Oh, you're big time TV. No, I'm not big time nothing. And so someone talked to the other day. I said, well, you're on television? I said, yeah, we're on television. They said, wow, that must cost a fortune. I said, no, not really but we got a great group of people that pay for it. So, wow, you must have a big church and be full-time, big TV, big time, big, on the big channel? I said, why don't you come on out Sunday and see the big time? Come on out here in the country with the cows, which is like Miss Carol, we drive up last Sunday morning, we drive up down here in the Alte, and all the black gals are over here by the fence, you know, and then they're kind of getting under the tree for the sun. And of course, you know, the tails are going up, you know, like they do, and, you know, and so forth. And Carol says, well, what's that cow doing carrying a stick? I said, that's his tail or her tail. She's flying flies, flies. So, you know, because the tail was going up like this, and she thought the cow was carrying a stick. So that's why I say, now, if you think we're such big time, come on out and see these country folks. Just a bunch of country pumpkins. Most of them live out in the rural, and they got, they got cows, they got horses, they got, they got pigs, they got goats, they got chickens. Oh, my goodness, they got snakes. And they have vegetables and all kinds of stuff. And there's about 40 of us. And they what? I said, yeah, we're not big time. We just have a will to win people for Christ and a love for souls. And, but we have a big God. I guess that was a confirmation. Thank you, Brother David. Amen. She had a secret day. She, she, she looks at him, scared her to death. But I'm glad you woke up, Renee. Amen. Praise the Lord. No, they're having a good time back there. Oh, where was I? We were thinking about the Facebook. Now, I'm serious about that. I'm going to present that to our church. We're going to send out a letter to our people and ask if there's anybody willing to do that. Now, folks, if we got 40 people, if every person was willing to give $5, $5, now, we all got $5. I don't know anybody in our church that doesn't have $5. And if you do, you see me later, and I'll give you one. No, I mean that. But I know our people, and I know we have some that are not as rich and wealthy as others, but we have no wealthy people in this church. 
No wealthy people in this church at all that I know of. If you are, you haven't told me yet. And don't. I don't need to know. But just think about it. See, we always, somebody will be sitting here tonight, and I saw some faces worth thinking about, man, maybe we could do that. Or, man, I would really like to do that for God. I'd like to do something so big for God, and that would be big for God. But I just don't have $180 a month. So then you know what that person does, like many of us have done through the years? Then we don't do nothing because we don't have the 180. Our heart's in it. The will's in it. But when the preacher says, now listen, we just need 40 people to give $5. $5, $5 foot long. Are you with me? Subway, foot long. $5, $5, $5 foot long. Amen? Now, if we had only 20 people to give $10, two foot longs, you see how it works? Then it, the load is lifted and distributed amongst everyone. And nobody's carrying the full load or the full burden. And then we all have a blessing in getting the gospel out to our town and our city with good stuff. And I wonder what got me going on this. I know we got to go. We may just finish this next week. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But anyway, she showed me something on the phone. She says, hey, you want to see this? I said, what is this? She said, this is one of our Baptist churches. She said, you got to see this. Uh, you got to be kidding me. So she turns it on. Here's this blue, all blue smoke, all blue lights. Hold that. Oh, this is, this is Tinkerbell stuff, okay? The whole auditorium is solid blue. And the, and the platform was all blue. And, and, and she said, this is a worship service. I said, oh, you got to be kidding me. And you know what they had on the platform? They had two ballet ballerina dancers. One of them was a man, I think. Oh, they were two girls. And oh, they were skin tight, ballerina dancing, hugging, and splitting, and throwing each other and all kinds of moves and so forth on the platform. This is in God's house in one of our Baptist churches. And that's why we need to be on the internet because we need to give people the truth of the gospel, not ballerinas sexually dancing on the platform. Because I'm just going to tell you as a man, if I'm sitting out in the audience watching that, my mind isn't going to be on winning souls. Now it's just time somebody tells you the truth. And some of you women have the same problem if there were two men up there doing it. You can't keep your mind wholesome and clean and meditate on good things when you got nothing but temptation and light porn, pornography in God's house on the platform. No wonder nobody knows what a real church is anymore. No wonder if anybody walks into this church and says, Whoa, this is a church? Man, these people are weird. That's why Jesus said, when I come, he said, will I find any faith on the planet when I arrive? How are you going to find faith on the planet when our churches are going to the discos and the lounges and looking like the bars and the night scenes on the platform in the house of God? Thank you, Jesus. And I'm not saying we're something special. We got other good churches in this city that are preaching the gospel. Mike West, Memorial Baptist. Dr. Smith, Walt Smith at Heritage Baptist. We got some other good men still taking a stand. Um, we got um, Andy Bloom, Central Baptist. We got Randy Brown at Friendship Baptist. But we're just a handful. That's why we need to be out there. So, Ms. Darlene, go home and work on a letter tonight. Spend some of those stamps we bought you. Let's challenge our people. Let's have a challenge. You ever been in services and churches where you have a challenge? You get a challenge, a challenge match, whatever. I don't care what you want to call it. Let's get a challenge and let's see if we can't raise $180 a month. 
I don't want to take it out of the general fund or the missions or anything else because all that's doing really well. The general fund's below or behind as always. That stays that way. We live that way. All right. Missions is doing great. The media fund's doing great. I mean, it's doing, you're, do, oh, you're doing a fantastic job on missions and media. Now, this would be part of the media, but let's, let's make it a little different. You see, because every ministry, I believe, and I was taught and learned from my pastor, that if we're going to have a ministry in the church outside of the general ministry of the church, and we're going to have stuff like that, it has to be self-supporting. We do not take it from the general fund. We do not take it from missions. So all of our television and radio is supported. It's separate from everything else. It is, totally has its own identity. It's self-supporting. And the day it quits self-supporting, it's done. We do not take it from missions or the general fund to pay for it. As long as it's self-supporting. I think that's what this would need to be to do. I think it's that important. We have the equipment. We have the cameras. We just don't have the means here. But if, see, if I could have, I said, can you get that thing and put it on a flash drive? Because I want to show that to the people on Sunday, what's going on in our city, in our churches. But that's the path we've taken, and that's the way we're going. Where are we at, five? How much more we got? You know what? Next week we finish it. George said he's hungry. So if he's hungry, and since I go eat with him, then, well, of course, I can't eat tonight. But, you know, I'm going to try anyway. But it's 10 after 8, so we'll go home tonight. And uh, I can't help but sometimes when God gets a hold of my heart and just lays things there as we're going through these things. None of this is planned. Trust me. I don't plan any of this. But when it comes out, it comes out. And I think it's just, you know, if it's in, done in good taste and good favor and, and done in, in the spiritual uh, attitude, a, a right attitude and heart and mind, and God doesn't mind. And we get something that's needed and necessary. Now, let me tell you, they're just mentioning on that since we're done. Brother Robert, you can cut it if you want to. All right, here, let's just have prayer. Father, thank you for tonight. We praise you. We love you. Thank you for what we've learned tonight. Help us to be obedient and apply it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. silent